Okay, so I'm going to follow up a little bit on this discussion about errors and how are errors possible. And I was trying to suggest in the previous video, and I still maintain this, that the hard line determinist position, I'm talking about hard determinism, is an incomprehensible position. It doesn't make any sense. And the people who try to thoroughly follow it through will see it's incoherent. It doesn't make any sense with our experience and with the way that we actually live our lives. Now, I don't think the other option is free will in some religious sandbag. Uh, there, to look at the comments on my video are, are so fascinating. People, please go look at the video that I'm linking below that I'm responding to here and look at the comment section and look at how differently people are haggling about it. That itself is so fascinating. I, the, the number of people who want to sort of throw the position on me that they have a quick ready critique for, but they're not really thinking about the actual question. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can't walk through it a little bit. Okay, first off, I think there are different kinds of errors that we see in the world, and it's not just our perceptions of things. Now, we can try to come at it that way. Okay, let me see if I can cut some of the differences and then, and then talk about it. There seem to be, and this is my understanding of it, right? There, there seem to be the experience of things not being right, of not being right, of something being wrong that is incorrect, which means that I had in my mind some way that it could be or should be, but in a fully deterministic universe, Everything couldn't help but be what it is. Now, someone might say, well, yeah, you're just determined to experience the error. At a certain point, though, that doesn't make any sense. That, that literally doesn't make any sense. I mean, do, do you see that the language that we're going to use keeps smuggling in something like an experience of the ability to choose otherwise? Now, not the ability to have chosen otherwise. I think there is something very important about this point over past behavior. When you look back over the past and you think that you could have done otherwise, you're pretending you weren't there. Now, there's something very important to understand that the past as past couldn't have been otherwise. You couldn't have done other than you did because that is literally pretending you weren't there. It's trying to give yourself an alibi. It's trying to hide from the decisions that you actually made. That's what that is. That doesn't mean though that we don't make decisions. Okay, but let me see if I can't... I'm going to get more to the decision stuff and the, the elongated present and how the present itself as a domain of mediation grows in history and how that domain liberates certain kinds of agency, deliberation, and what we experience as some kind of freedom. It's not superlative freedom coming from on high. It has to do with emergent freedom that's built evolutionarily through organisms that were able to relate to themselves through communication technologies and gain the distance from themselves to come back to themselves with a little bit of reflection and some distance and some, some foresight. Okay. So, so let's take some different errors, and these would be ones I'd throw out for people to consider. Okay, now, and these are, you know, some, I guess, that came from the list, and some that just from, uh, maybe I should have spent more time on the video. I was trying to keep it really brief. Okay, so you could try to stick with really simple ones, like, okay, so there's a sense of, I'm typing and I make a typo, or I'm calling someone and I type in the wrong number, and I get the wrong person, and they say, oh, you got the wrong number on a phone call. Now, was that an error? Now, in some way, we could say, well, yes, obviously, I pushed the wrong buttons and I got the wrong number. Well, where comes the framework that it was wrong? From where is that framework coming? Now, you might say, well, you were trying to call one person and you got another one. Yeah, but my trying from the hardline determinist position was not my trying at all. It was just the outcome of previous acts. So in some sense, I just did whatever I did. Where are you? You're introducing some beginning line of agency there. Do, do people see that? 
okay, okay let's think of the, think of the say I'm typing something and I absolutely I, I, I accidentally hit the wrong key and I leave a typo in there and I look back and I go oh wait no that isn't right yeah well of course my body just you know it, it types wherever it, it goes and if I make a mistake I see the mistake but it's my ability to think of it other than it actually occurred that allows me to see it as the mistake that it is. Right? I'm imagining what I want, and that's somehow not what it is. But when I say I'm imagining what I want, I'm giving myself some kind of non-deterministic liberties there. This is why when, when Fred talks about determinism light, I, as, as I understood it, there seem to be very subtle ways in which people keep smuggling in some kind of agency. And I guess I was trying to rally with him going, yeah, when you move to the issue of errors and problems and discrepancies, inaccuracies, the whole realm where negativity comes in, you're going to have this issue of the experience of agency. Okay, let's... So someone looks down and they see what they think to be a snake and then, oh, nope, it's a rope. And they say, oh, I was wrong. It wasn't a snake. It was just a rope. Okay. And they say, well, how is that? You know, that's an error and it's, full of, it's from a fully deterministic universe. Okay. How is that fully deterministic? I guess I want to end up saying if you see something and then you realize that you were in error Okay, you're going on, but I guess I'm wondering where where is the non-agency there? See, there seems like there was a person there who realizes that they were in error. Now, how is that possible? Why didn't you have one experience, rope, and then or, I'm sorry, one experience, snake, and then another experience, rope, and where is this you who compared the experiences to say that that one is incorrect? That is, where is the error when you thought the error was this thing and then it was really something else? You see what I'm saying? That you're introducing... <clears> How <throat> oh, I said, see, I think a lot of people, okay, let me back up here. I guess I'm all over the place. I think some people want to believe that the only errors are errors of thought, that they're going to do something like this, like the world is perfect. The world is just as it is, but thought is the problem. Uh, there's even a response kind of saying, well, you know, it's, it's really in the intentionality of the person. It's the person's intentionality which recognizes the error as error. And without the conscious intentions of a person claiming that it's an error, there is no error. And that's, again, I was trying to illustrate that. But there, I think you end up with some, some, some sense of conscience, intention, or some sort of conscious intentionality that we end up, okay, well, this is some kind of agency of some sort. It's being exercised. Um, okay, if, if people want to say that it's simply an issue of how we assign errors, how we say that something is an error, or the conscious recognition of error, and so that the only kinds of errors are us thinking of errors, that there's no errors in the world, I guess I want to raise questions about birth defects. Okay, so a birth defect happens and we look down and some baby is born without limbs. Okay, the baby is born without limbs. Is that just variety or is that an error? Now, how would you know that that's an error? When we say that DNA has, de has redundancy built into itself in order to prevent errors and minimize errors in the transmission of genetic information, Okay, what is that? Why does apparently something non-conscious without any sense of agency, okay, and, I, and I'm going to say, hopefully we're in agreement here, DNA does not have any agency. DNA does not have any agency. But there's information. There's information at that level of DNA. Can there be errors there? Can there be various forms of birth defects as 
error in the gene, in the DNA, or is there no error at all? Things are just unfolding according to as they had to unfold. Now, if you say that a birth defect is an error, you're imagining that it could have been otherwise. Right? Or no? See, I, I think we're back to this, this issue of to what extent is there delay? To what extent is there lag time in commitment? To what extent is the present an elongated present that opens and stretches itself along enough to make little, little tiny differences of decisions? It doesn't have to be these grand superlative senses of free will like you just self-fashion and you do whatever you want with yourself and you have supreme control over yourself. I mean, some of that's just ridiculous. But to deny it all the way down, to deny that we make small moments, uh, and this is why you know, I find the compatibilist position of Dennett so far superior to the kind of drivel and or garbage that Sam Harris puts his name on. Uh, I find some of that just to be ridiculous. How anyone finds that, how they're able to take it seriously, I guess they don't. Uh, I can't. I guess other people don't because to take it seriously would imagine that they could do such a thing. I guess people just read it and respond to it like they do. Uh, just, you know as atmosphere just happening in the air. I mean, some people with the hardline determinist positions, it's it's as if they act like life never occurred. And then from there, like culture never emerged out of life. It's it's everything is just matter in motion. They seem not to realize complexities of emergence, complexities that come from the the kinds of and domains of presence, domains of mediacy that evolution has made possible, right? So let me see if I can give some really quick examples. Okay, my guess is that if you watch yourself very carefully, you will see that you can think before you speak. You can think about some things. You could say, hmm, should I say something? And then you will decide what you're going to say. And now, it's not always the case. I don't think we want to be dogmatic there. There's lots of times when we just spontaneously speak our thoughts. But there are other times when we can think through what we're going to say before we commit it to words. And once they become words, now you can't take them back. Now, your thoughts you can't take back, but your thoughts are always private. And in that sense, to think rather than to say is to exercise the freedom of whether or not you're going to inflict this upon others or whether you're going to keep it to yourself. That could be a very big difference. It makes all the difference in the world, whether you're keeping that to yourself or you're going to say it all out. And you have a choice whether to commit that. Very often. Not always. Very often. Now, let's take that. Uh, once you do start to speak, there is a little bit of choice in how you're going to select your words. It's almost like thought is like a shadow cast if you're walking, uh, what is it, westward in the morning, where it's sort of like the, the shadow is rising ahead of you and allows some determination of the, the possible words that you could choose to help complete this sentence and to help it make sense. And that's part of what you're doing. But even there, there seems to be another question of, do you decide to take what you've said and then write it down? See, when I, when I move to the difference between thought and speech, and then speech and writing, and the kinds of deliberation and decision making that goes on. So I'm thinking something and I say, okay, that's right. I'm actually going to say this now and commit this to once I've said it now, I couldn't have not said it. Now that what I thought I couldn't have not thought, but still that's private. When I said it, now I couldn't have not said it. And now that's out in the open. But now once I've said it, I had this question of, do I write this and do I commit this to paper? Do I put it on, on video? Do I upload the video once? I've recorded it. See, it seems like communication and communication technologies 
have to be addressed because these are the key to understanding how time has opened itself in a certain kind of emergence through evolutionary process. And it began hundreds of thousands of years ago, arguably at least a hundred thousand uh, with speech. And it has been slowly modified with calendars and with bank accounts and to, to try to dismiss the way that communication technologies open up a space under which deliberation occurs, I think you're just being naive, you're being dogmatic, you're being ridiculous. Part of it's just ridiculous. I, I almost don't even want to be in the conversation. I find it funny. I mean, part of it's, it's, it's funny to watch all the different comments. Um, I don't know why people can't see I guess part of me is just, it's almost, it's almost baffling that the fully hard line determinist position, and I mean determinist all the way down, you can't even think it. It doesn't even make any sense. I mean, try to think, uh, let me, I'm going to end with one last example. And this has to do with the rise of anxiety. You know, Kierkegaard called the modern age, the age of anxiety, and he was talking about what happened when the telegraph hit. See, the telegraph introduced anxiety because it gave people information from radically distant places that they were now aware of but really couldn't do much about. And the rise of, of, of awareness of information over which you can't directly act, this seems to be some part of our experience of agency. And so anxiety, it's not simply that we're determined to experience anxiety and anxiety is a kind of determination from our conditions I would say it in almost the other way and say that no it's because of our agency it's because we experience some sense of freedom some sense to choose that we have the sense of anxiety anxiety is a register of the fact that we feel our agency it's not that you're just determined to, to experience anxiety due to various neurophysiological, chemical stuff. You can't get out of that, and that's going to be that all the way down. See, I mean, let's take a really simple example. Okay, here's my pen. Now, my pen always is only wherever it is. It's right here on my right hand, and now it's in my left hand, right? It's in my right hand, here it is, and now it's in my left hand. It's always only where it is. But with language, I can talk about where it was and where it might be. I can say, I think I'm going to put it in my other hand. Should I? Should I not? See, as soon as you get to language, language introduces an entire representational order that allows for pr a pre-thought deliberation over the things, which means that we can have anxiety over the possibilities that we're facing. Okay. Thank you. If, if we were fully determined, why would we ever feel anxiety? Now, you could say, well, we're just determined to. Could you make a ping pong ball anxious? All right, thank you.